Hello, my name is Hugh Elms. I've lived in Wareham all of my life, and today I'm on a quest. You know, I'm very lucky I've got the key of the door. Who would have thought I was 21? I'm not 21, I'm only 18. But what a lovely key. My quest is to track down a Thomas Edward Lawrence. You may remember him as being a Lawrence of Arabia. The latter part of his life he spent a lot of time in Wareham. He lived in Bovington. Unfortunately in 1935 he was involved in an accident and unfortunately he passed away. But at least I found him now in a recumbent position. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm looking for Michael O'Hara, the curator, please. My name's Hugh. I was very pleased to meet you. Oh. Um, I was looking at a newspaper and I saw that on the year 2005, it was the 70th anniversary of the death of Lawrence of Arabia. I'll be honest, I don't know a great deal about him. And you just can't understand why he had that name and why he happened to live in that little cottage at Clouds Hill. Can you explain more to me about him, please? Well, Lawrence moved to Dorset in 1923 when he joined the Royal Tank Corps. Um, he was really looking for anonymity and at that time you could enlist in the army uh, under a pseudonym and he changed his name from T. Lawrence to T. E. Shaw. What made him change his name? Well, he was really trying to hide from the media. Lawrence, in a way, was one of the 20th century's first celebrities. And since he left the RAF, which was his previous enlisting, he'd been on the run, more or less, from the uh, tabloid newspapers of the day. You make him sound as though he was a prisoner. You know, how many names did the man have then? Well, he had three names. Why did he have so many names? Was it a tax fiddle? <laughs> no, it wasn't a tax fiddle. Um, Lawrence was born Thomas Edward Lawrence and he was the illegitimate son of uh, an Anglo-Irish uh, aristocrat named yes. Sir Thomas Chapman. And Sir Thomas Chapman had an affair with a governess in his employ and they sort of ran away together to start a family. And they moved to uh, a small suburb in North Oxford and they took the name Lawrence. It's very confusing, doesn't it? So why did he keep changing his name? Well, he was really trying to uh, sort of delve back into obscurity because um, his exploits in the desert during the First World War uh, had created such a lot of interest. And it, it was quite unwelcome interest as far as Lawrence was concerned. During his time at Bobbington, when he, he moved from uh, a barrack block situation into Cloud Hill Cottage, he was suffering basically a, a nervous breakdown. So it's very sad to think a man in his position and all it is has brought him unhappiness. And so therefore he's looking for something different in life. I think he was a man who had a certain masochistic streak. I think that he felt that he'd, he'd let the Arabs down and probably let himself down because he, he had very, very high principles. He was a man who had friends in, in extremely high places and he commanded 
uh, an enormous amount of respect from uh, s certain individuals in, in high places. He was also, um, by some other important individuals, um, considered to be a threat and a danger. Aeroplanes and flight were, were really his, his, became his main interest. And he pulled an enormous amount of strings to, um, to try and uh, get re-enlisted into the RAF. And of course eventually it worked and, and that's exactly what he did. I understand that when he was in the RAF he went to India and there was problems which were raised in the House of Commons. Yeah, that's correct. Um, Lawrence was posted to uh, an RAF base on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. You have to remember that his position there was an extremely lowly one. However, it coincided with an Afghani rebellion and certain MPs who were aware of Lawrence being there asked the question in the House whether his proximity to that rebellion had some bearing on it. Uh, it was all very embarrassing for the, the RAF who, ver who very quickly shipped him back to England and he probably spent from that period, from 1928 to the point where he left the RAF, um, the happiest part of his life and they used his skills in the development of fast RAF rescue boats. This is rather odd with him, he was interested in a lot of fast things wasn't he, with motorcycles and various things. After he retired from the RAF, I think it was only a few months he had a retirement, unfortunately, poor fellow, before he was involved with an accident. And the accident was due to fast motorbikes which he used to have. These were made by a chap called George Bruff, I believe. And I was told his mm. bike was often seen in wear, and they said he used to have a smaller rear wheel so that his legs could touch the ground when he was stationary. Have you got a photograph of that bike I could look at, please? Actually, just recently, we, um, we were searching through some photographs in our collection uh, and we found an old postcard of the town taken in about 1930. And uh, lo and behold, there's Lawrence's bike. Can you tell me anything about the accident, about those two lads in the way he came off his motorbike? Lawrence was coming up from the tank park at Bovington uh, camp and he was going towards the cottage at Clouds Hill. He was travelling at some speed, which uh, was his sort of normal thing. And when he came over the rise of, of the hill, he found himself immediately upon two boys on bicycles, uh, one of which was a delivery boy and uh, the other one was his friend. And he braked to avoid the boys, lost control of the bike and more or less flew over the handlebars, struck the road and ended up against a tree. Uh, one of the boys uh, ended up sort of lying in the middle of the road and the other boy was badly shaken up and shot by the incident. The two lads that were involved in the accident, are they still alive? No, uh, unfortunately Frank Fletcher and Bert Hargreaves uh, are no longer with us. But there is um, uh, a brother of Frank Fletcher who is still surviving and he lives here in Wareham. Do you happen to know his first name? Yep, his name is Joe, Joseph Fletcher. You know, that makes it rather exciting. What I think I'll do now, I'll go home and see if I can find Joe Fletcher's phone and we'll give him a phone call. I'd love to have words with him to see if he can remember anything about that crucial day. But first of all, I'm going to have a coffee and I'm going to the Angleberry and sit in this chair where Lawrence used to sit. Sir, would you like a coffee? Yes, please, that'd be lovely. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, young lady. Thank you. You know, it seems remarkable that he sat here this afternoon and the sitting in a seat, which has got a mark there, to say where Lawrence of Arabia used to sit. We know full well that Lawrence of Arabia did a lot of shopping in Wareham 
and often he used to park his motorcycle down by the red line, he'd wander up here and do his shopping. And also if we look out through the window, you'll see a large white building across the road. That was Mr. Skews's private school. And Lawrence became very, very friendly with Mr. Skews and after the uh, classrooms had finished in the afternoon, sometimes he'd go across and knock on the door and the two of them go for a walk around Wareham. They often made their way to St. Martin's Church. I am going to follow in Lawrence's footsteps and make my way up North Street to the north of the town. The church we're standing in today naturally is St. Martin's Church. This is on the northern end of the town at the top of North Street and this church is over a thousand years old. Now I'm going to explain to you why Lawrence came to rest here at the end with his effigy. But before we do this, Lawrence used to visit this church, but I'm going to take you back a little further to that. 1762 was when we had the fire of Wareham, and so much of Wareham was damaged that the residents of the town had to come and live here. And somebody captured this, a Kenneth Allen has drawn an artist impression as the people were moving in. You can see there where the tables are being made, where the wood is being sawn, so they can have places to have their meals and sit down. After that, the church was left for very many years, it just deteriorated. And I've got a picture here of how the church looked before they brought the effigy of Lawrence and had started to tidy it up again. Now, you may wonder why Lawrence's effigy was brought here. Well, let me just explain a little bit more about Lawrence and Lawrence's connection with Wareham. After he retired, he moved into Bovington, as I said earlier, and he became friendly with a man called Mr. Skews, who was the principal of a school in North Street. And after he'd finished in the afternoon, sometimes the two of them would walk up here together and look at the church. The church was a great interest to Lawrence because Lawrence had spent a lot of his earlier days uh, tracing and tracking down crusaders castles in Arabia and this, uh, this church was in such a bad state it reminded him so much of one of those crusaders castles. Also Lawrence fell in love with the Wareham's town sign, the stars and the mouth, he thought that was very very Arabic. Eric Cannington who was a personal friend of Lawrence of Arabia who spent a lot of time doing the artwork and various things in several of Lawrence's books. Apparently he did the artwork in the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. It's rather nice to think of Lawrence um, with Eric Kennington doing this work that they have named a little uh, crescent around the back of the church called the Kennington's Place. This is a little part of Wareham around the back of the church and I think it's rather nice that Eric Kennington's name will carry on as part of Wareham life now. Also I see somebody's named their house after Eric Kennington. Originally when Eric Kennington made this, it was going to go to St Paul's Cathedral. But it was Lawrence's younger brother who thought that Lawrence spent so much time and enjoyed it being in the atmosphere here. He felt this was the right place. So he went and saw the Bishop of Salisbury and the Bishop of Salisbury agreed that the effigy could stay here.
Hello, is that Mr. Fletcher? Yeah. Hello, my name's Huey Elms. Herbie's boy. Yeah, Herbie's boy, that's right, yeah. Mr. Fletcher, I hope you don't mind me phoning. We're trying to do some research on Lawrence of Arabia. And I understand that your brother's died, uh, who was involved in the accident, and whether, whether you could help us at all with any of the memories you had as being a member of the family. Oh, yes. I've had some paperwork. You've got what? You've got some paperwork? Yes. Oh, yes, that would be interesting. We would be grateful if we could have that. Can I go back to the museum and tell them that we could make arrangements to meet you? Oh, I'd be happy to. I'd be smashing. OK, then, Mr Fletcher. Right, Huey, I'll call you Joe. All right, Joe. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'll come back to you later. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Joe, it's very unfortunate that your poor brother Frank's not with us anymore. And, of course, I believe he was with a gentleman called Bert Hargreaves at the time. That's correct. Did you ever know Bert? Yes, I knew Bert very well, yes. He was a friend of uh, Frank's, with was chums, and he used to come indoors and see, and see us sometimes. And, yes, I knew Bert very well. Both Bert and Frank, during the accident, they got, got off scot-free, they were all right, and they weren't hurt or anything? Oh, no injuries at all. No, no, they just, well, they fell off the bikes, of course, but no, no injuries to themselves. Bert Hargreaves was shock. He was in hospital for two days, so that they get the stories right and everything else, the government. And, Joe, it's a very awkward thing to say, but can you remember exactly what happened on that day, the first time you heard about it? Where were you on that day? I was indoors, actually, when I heard about it. And uh, it was when Frank came in, I suppose. It must have been about, oh, in the afternoon sometime, I should think. Joe, do you think it ever changed your brother's life? Your brother left where and he went and lived at London. Do you think the press drove him away or anything like that? Well, it did change his life, yes. I mean, because he had these people keep ringing up and keep trying to make appointments, and he had to keep telling the same story, and he did really get a bit browned off with it after a bit. And of course, it wasn't just one day, it was week after week, month after month, all different people, you know. Even the Japanese uh, rung him up and wanted to have an appointment with him for the story. He was really browned off with it after, after a while. Isn't it dreadful how accidents happen? You know, it's so silly. There's your, your brother and his friend cycling along, and I believe Lawrence comes up behind them on his big bike. That's right. He tries to swerve to miss them. That's, that's right. And I believe the actual road itself it was just a, a very few trees on it. Well, that's right. There's only about three trees on the common itself where it happened. And uh, he and swerved and... Uh, as bad luck would have it, he hit one of them. And that was the and end. that was the end of a poor man. Joe, did your brother ever go and see the film they made of Lawrence? Oh, yes. He went with my mother and father. They all went down together. And they watched the film together, and they rather enjoyed the film. But uh, my brother's a little bit disappointed on the actual way they took the film, because it wasn't nothing like the area that he was in. Is there anything you'd like to tell us, sir? Anything which you can remember? My brother, Frank, had had a rough day with his accident and uh, he wanted to go to the pictures. And at that time, to go into the pictures was two pence at the Bubbleman camp. And um, Mother said, uh, you got a penny in your pocket, didn't you, Joe? I said, I said yes. Well, he said, give it to Frank, make Frank tuppence up so he can go to the pitches, because he's, really, he's not very happy. So I gave him the penny, and uh, I wasn't very happy either, but still, <laughs> he went to the pitches. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you very much indeed, Joe, but just as a matter of interest, if you recall, when I spoke to you on the phone, you said you had some paperwork appertaining to your brother. Oh, yes. And you're going to bring it along. Would you mind if we brought it along? We had a meeting one evening. Oh, I'll bring that down for you. Yes, Certainly, you I'll sort it all out and bring it down to you. So, Joe, anyway, well, thank you very On much. the morning of the accident, Lawrence was on his way home from Bovington Camp to his cottage. Although Lawrence was a man of action, he was also an academic with a great love of classical language and music. In particular, Beethoven and Elgar, whose violin concerto, played by the young Yehudi Menuhin, totally captivated him. Once again, we've got something written in uh, Latin there. I wish how to find exactly what that does mean, because of course we also have that on the bottom of Lawrence's uh, gravestone. So that's another question I'll have to ask Michael when I get back. You know, it's rather funny when we look around here, it's the most beautiful spot, this is Clouds Hill. 
This is a home which I think he had for about 10 or 12 years. In all those times, there was never a lavatory built here. In all winds and weathers, if you can picture a man going out there with a shovel and a piece of paper and to do his business, what an odd way to ever carry on, wasn't it? Actually, the house is very unique when you go inside. Upstairs, we have the one room there, um, which is a sitting room. He's got a lovely horn gramophone there, which I'd like to be here to hear it play. It's um, rather unique because most of the horn gramophones had metal horns, and this is a paper mashy one. He has another room there which is done out in a tin foil. And the reason it's done as a tin foil, he used to keep his food there as a way of preserving his food. We come downstairs, he has another large room which he would sit and write his seven pillars of wisdom and other various things. And also we have his bathroom here, which is about as I said once before, even though he's got a very nice bathroom, uh, there is no toilet. But it is well worth a visit. If you come to the Ware Museum, do make the next stop and go to Clouds Hill and follow on the Lawrence story. I think you'll be amazed. It may appear lonely here, but he did have neighbours. This afternoon we're with Mrs Lane. Now Mrs Lane... Call me Mel, please. Right, that makes life a lot easier. <laughs> now the reason why we're with Mrs Lane is because it was her uncle who was Mr Pat Knowles. Now Mr Knowles is shown here in this paper here, and this is a copy from the Daily Sketch Monday May the 20th. And there they say that Mr Pat Knowles was from Mr T Shaw's Batman. Now he was your uncle, I believe. Yes, he was. And can you tell us anything about your uncle, about how he got involved? And well, um, I think Lawrence bought the cottage from his father. So Mr Knowles was the neighbour. He lived the opposite side of the yes, road. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. But he spent yeah. a lot of time with Lawrence. Oh yes, he yeah, did. Yeah. I mean, he he has well, he was known to have slept over there as well, with keeping him company. He was more or less like a companion to him, actually. I, I suppose in a way he must be like a brother with him living yeah, next door, yeah. just as, you know, the two yes, of them he, there, was, yeah. he was a companion. Yeah. He was. Now I understand also it is Clouds Hill. He, he had a swimming pool there. Yes, he did. And it was a lovely swimming pool. He had these magnificent doors. What was special about the doors, then? Oh, they were carved. They were beautifully carved. What, in a swimming pool? Yes. The doors to go into it. So they they, they came somewhere from yes, Arabia, yeah, somewhere yeah. like that. Yeah. And he used to swim there quite a lot. And do, do you know and whether Pat Lawrence... used to as well. So Pat and Lawrence swam there. Yeah, he yeah. swam there. But, uh, but he only used to swim when Lawrence wasn't there. I see, yeah. But just a matter of interest, so this was on Pat's side of the road, or was it on Clouds Hill's? On Pat's side. side. So it was yeah. in Pat's property, yes. Yes, yes. Because it's down the bottom of the yeah. garden, and you beat your way through bushes to get to yeah. it. <laughs> so it looks as though Lawrence left the, left the house to Pat. He must have done. Left it, and that's how Pat, and then the end of the day. So it was those which opened the house to the public originally, wasn't it? Mr. Pat, and Mrs. Yeah. Knowles, yeah. Yes, the Knowleses. Yeah. So, well, my aunt, I think. Yes. I think a national trust asked her to do it. To do that, yes, mm. once they owned it. And yeah. she did for mm. 50 years. So you've got a book there as well. What was yeah. the story of the book? That was by Patrick. So my he uncle. wrote that. He wrote that with cooperation with his wife. That's a pencil drawing for the mint. And that's Pat. Pat Knowles there, yes. Just after the fatal accident. That's Lawrence before leaving the RF and that's Lawrence on his way, taken by one of my uncle's um, brothers. This is a photograph of, of Lawrence's funeral and that is my uncle there and just in sight there is Churchill. Can I have a look? And that's that hand-drawn hearst. A beer. That, that's what it was called? Yes. These are some letters you've got on the table as well. These are phototype ones. So the original letters, they were sold at... Yeah, in Dorchester, yes. And of course we have the signatures at the end of each one. Yes. Here's a letter here. 19th of the 4th, 1928. Dear Pat, two months your letter took to get here. Not bad for Fort Fitzgerald. I have just made up my mind that it is better to try to get a change of station. There is a helpless submission about animals and a cheerful dependence which pulls our heartstrings. I wish I could write to you decently, but you are too far away. This half-world is a very great roundness to bulk between us. 
Yours truly, T.E. Shaw. In his letters, he writes first, Dear Knowles, and then later on it becomes a little more personal, Dear Pat. So I presume that that was when they got a little more friendly or something, or the relationship mm. changed or something. I suppose a man like Lawrence, um, being in the services all the time, and then when he was out of the service, he must be lost in a way, mustn't he? And to have Pat as a constant companion and keep an eye on him was a wonderful thing for oh, him, Oh, yes, it? I yeah. think it must have been. Yeah. Because he, he did, he, kept, he, was, he was over there a, a lot, you know, he was yeah. looked after him yeah. a lot. Yeah, which was wonderful. And of course, my aunt cooked meals for as him. As well, yes. And both of them having the interest in the motorcycles oh, yes. could have been better companion, couldn't they? No, it? they were very no. good companions, no. I would yeah. think, yes. So much has been written about it, but we're so lucky to be able to meet people like yourself and people like Joe Fletcher, yes. which were there about in the Times and have got stories to relate mm. and genuine stories and not yes. just mess something which I imagine. No. And when we sum up for Pat Knowles, that was your uncle, so as I say, yeah. He was involved with Lawrence. Can you oh, say yes, anything else about him? He was involved with him very closely, I think. Yeah. Lawrence renounced his rank as Colonel and joined the RAF as Aircraft Man Ross, but he was dismissed because of unwelcome publicity. Using yet another name, he enlisted in the Royal Tank Regiment at Bovington as Private T. Shaw, where he shared a barrack hut with other soldiers. Clouds Hill provided a relief from camp life and a quiet place for him to write his great work the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Lawrence's exploits in the desert won him respect and admiration among the great and the good, many of whom travelled to Dorset to mourn his passing. Well, here we are at the cemetery at Morton. This is where poor old Lawrence came to rest after the fatal accident. Seems funny a place like Morton in the centre of Dorset where his body should be left. The train brought them to Morton Station where they caught taxis here to St Nicholas's Church. At the graveside the people who came to pay their last respects including Winston Churchill and his wife, Augustus John the painter and Eric Kennington, the man who did the um, sculpture work of him, C. Fleece Sassoon, the poet, Lady Astor and Mrs Thomas Hardy. She was the wish she was a widow by then. They all stood here on this spot and all said farewell to poor old Lawrence. As we look at the gravestone, we can't help but notice this, this like an open book, which appears to be written in Latin. Um, I'm not a Latin, I'm not a scholar of that nature, but I must ask Michael when we get back if he can understand what those words mean. Well, the grave looks very well maintained. It's rather colourful with these roses here. There apparently there's always are flowers laying on his grave, but it doesn't say who they're from. So there's where poor old Lawrence finished up. <laughs> so look at his stone there. And I believe they brought him over from the church on a hand truck. And the truck is still in the village. I'm going to see whether I can find that. And once we found that, I like to then go to St Nicholas's Church where the service was carried out. So after leaving Lawrence's grave, we made our way to the Morton Tea Rooms. Here we were surprised to see the actual hearse which was used to carry Lawrence's body from the church to the graveyard. I suppose it was about 600 yards they used this with the coffin on. When you think of a man of his status in Wareham, we have the Wareham Hospital, which years ago, years ago used to be the workhouse. And paupers, people who had no money, they were always taken to the graveyard on a handcart. And it seems rather odd that Lawrence should have finished up on a handcart and not a horse-drawn hearse, as one would have thought at that time. But this is the actual hearse which pulled him over there. This was pulled manually by a man, and here's the handle, and of course the turntable there, which allowed him to steer it. As I say, the distance was approximately 600 yards from the church to the graveyard. Uh, wrought iron wheels, it's the most beautifully made thing, spoke wheels, everything as things used to be made. Technically, I think a thing like this will last forever. Many people turned out on the 21st of May 1935 for the funeral of Lawrence. St Nicholas's Church, Morton Village, Dorset. 
The presence of Nicholas Church was largely rebuilt after the war, following severe damage caused by a bomb in October 1940. As we walk up the steps of the church, it's hard to imagine this is the scene of Lawrence's funeral all those years ago. Similar in design to the pre-war church, it was enhanced by 12 unique engraved glass windows, the work of Lawrence Whistler. It's surprising how much light passes through these windows, brightening up the whole church. To think this was the actual church where the service took part before they laid him to rest at the graveyard which we've already seen. This morning I've got to go and look at some motorcycles as written by Lawrence of Arabia. And these are Bruff motorbikes. And these are designed by George Bruff. I've got a gentleman here, Mark, who's going to meet me. And this morning, as I say, he's got three bikes there ready for me to have a look at, which is rather exciting. It's a lovely collection, isn't it, Mark? Good morning to you. So, uh, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. And what can you tell me about this bike here, please? Well, this is an SS100. Bruff Superior, made originally in 1925, but it was modified in the 1950s to make it, bring it up to date a bit. It's a much used machine, very powerful for its, uh, for its age. Where did George Bruff, you know, learn about making bikes? Oh, from, from his father, who, who made motorcycles back in the early part of the 20th century in Nottingham. So it was brought into him, born into him as such. Absolutely, well, he, yes. he grew up uh, with it, yes. Yes, as a teenager, he was riding his dad's bikes in trials. So he invented, which is this one here? This, this, is, a, this is a 1929 SS80, which has a side valve Jap engine. So that's a side valve one? Yes, that's yeah. right, and that's, <laughs> that's the overhead valve job. So when did the word superior come on to it? Oh, when, when George started making his own motorbikes in 1921 or 1920, he conjured up this name, Bruff Superior. So was he still working with his father? Well, no, he split off. So there was competition then? Absolutely, and his dad said, I suppose that makes mine the Bruff Inferior. <laughs> what a dreadful thing to have that competition Absolutely. between the two, wasn't That's it? Right, yes. Yeah. Now we come on up here, I believe, to your bike here. Mine. And so this is the one which you own yourself. That's right. And this is, uh, what year is this one? This is 1925. 1925. So yours isn't a side valve. No, this is an overhead valve Jap engine. So that was a Jap engine he fitted in there. Bruff didn't make his own engine then? Oh no, no, he never made his own motor. He bought them from whoever he could, um, he could get the best engine from. Uh, these were made by J.A. Presswich in Tottenham in London. These particular motors were their most powerful engine and they were used for record breaking at Brooklands and, and that type of racing mm. event. So he bought that in and what sort of transmission? Oh, the, um, it's a three-speed gearbox, and he used gearboxes made by Sturmey Archer. Well, St Sturmey Archer, the people used to make them for the bicycles. That's right. And they made them for these as well? Absolutely. Would that have worked on the same system? Or? Oh, not at all, no. no. It's, it's not the, it's not the t same type of gearbox. 
Um, he, George Bruff had trouble with the gearboxes when he first matched them up to these engines and the gearboxes yeah. were breaking. He had to get Sturming Archer to beef them up. So the torque, there just, just wasn't Far a man enough for them. So he actually built the frames? He made the frames and the, the petrol tank, which is his own design, which was a special yes. feature of the Bruff. The front forks were Harley Davidson type, which he later on made his own pirated version, which he called the Castle Fork. Did he do anything t to modify the engine? Did he surface grind the heads to give it a higher compression? Well, they, they came, as in this form, from the Jap factory, from mm. Presswich's factory, and George wanted them in the, uh, for this model in the virtually the highest tune that was then available. This bicycle we've got here seems to be a standard bike, yes. but I'm led to believe that Lawrence had a smaller rear wheel mm. because he was only a short man. Mm. Lawrence was a particularly short man. He was very short in the leg, <laughs> and he must have had real trouble touching the ground on this, this model, which has a, actually a 28-inch beaded edge wheel on the back. Yes. Nonetheless, I believe that the first of these machines he had did have that wheel in, possibly with the, the saddle modified to get it to the lowest possible position. But the later models, he probably did have a smaller mm -hmm. wheel. Well, I'd like to hear the engine if we could get mm -hmm. it started and have a go. But just one thing I was reading, he was a great help to Bruff, and he used to go backwards and forwards. He had many bikes off Bruff, didn't he? He had five, six, oh, something seven, like that. Seven, over a period uh, of time, yeah. He, yeah. he wore them out fairly yeah. fast. Uh, I read it was described as the Rolls-Royce of motorbikes. That was George's time. own... Yes, his uh, own slope. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the bike there. Let's look around the other side and have a look at it from that angle. And that's got a Lucas headlamp, hasn't it? It's got yeah. the Lucas crest yeah. on there, so it's Lucas exactly, were doing their exactly stuff. Yeah. This is interesting, the way the push rods are, isn't it, and the overhead valve. So there's no cover on it. So all the muck could get up on those springs of yes, that. They're not uh, considered... Absolutely. Mm. In the early days of overhead valve engines with motorcycles, they um, were originally racing engines, and it didn't matter having it exposed. It was more air cooling to the to the valves and so forth. And help to keep the weight down as well. That's right. And here's our friend Sturmy Archer, yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's, that's the, the gear, gear change gear. there. Yeah. Well, that's marvellous, isn't it? Here we are, the Tank Museum at Bovington. This looks like a fine statue which is done here. Very fine statue. The Royal Tank Regiment Memorial Statue. A lovely gesture for all those men. This is the entrance. Each time I come here it changes, gets bigger and better all the time. As a coincidence today I received a letter and on it was a stamp with the 1930 Bruff Superior. Of course, it's the Bruff Superior which we've come to look at today, not one which belonged to Lawrence, but the type of bike which he would have ridden. You know, it all surprised me each time I come to this museum, how they change it, how they update it. It's the most interesting museum. I've known it for many years, and uh, it is well worth a visit for the family. But today, of course, we're here to look at the motorcycle, or a motorcycle, like Lawrence would have had, a Bruff Superior. So I believe there's one in this ca glass cabinet over here. And here's the motorbike which is on display in the glass cabinet. This is a Bruff Superior, made by the same people who supplied the bikes to Lawrence of Arabia. It is very interesting, if you remember when we spoke to Mark, after we'd finished our filming there with him, he was explaining to me about the fuel tank. And if you notice, the fuel tank has two caps, one half of the tank was for the petrol, and the other half of the tank was for oil. This had to be primed to get the pressure up to feed the oil around the engine. 
all modern bikes today have oil pumps fitted. But in this day, there was no oil pump. So as I say, this had to be done by hand. We know that Lawrence had seven motorcycles in his time, and it worked out roughly every two years he would change the bike. I think by that time, Bruff had brought out another bike. He'd modified it so it got that slightly little bit faster, and Lawrence felt he had to have it. But as I say, this is one of the bikes which you've already heard, and it gives you an opportunity to inspect it up close. Well, I think I've told you enough about the motorcycle itself, but whilst in the museum, I want to go across and see the rest of the Lawrence collection. Then after that, I'm going to spend the day going around the tanks. There's over a day for me here, just wandering around, looking in amazement. It's well worth a visit. Oh, hello, Hugh. Nice to see you again. Morning, Michael. Nice to see you as well. When I went to Clouds Hill, I couldn't help but notice above the main door, there's a lintel, and it's got inscribed, I think it's Latin words. Can you explain what those words are, please? Uh, well, the, the, the words above the door are actually Greek, and basically they mean, why worry? So it's not Latin, it's Greek? It's Greek, yeah. It's uh, ironic, really, because uh, Lawrence's time at Clouds Hill um, especially the early years, um, he underwent um, a tremendous amount of uh, mental pressure. Well, what we would call today, I would think, a nervous breakdown. And I presume that that inscription was to sort of constantly remind him um, that really there wasn't any need to worry. Michael, whilst I was at Morton, naturally I went to the graveyard to see the grave. And I happened to notice the stone open book with inscriptions on. Can you explain what those inscriptions are, please? Well, it's an inscription in Latin, uh, Dominus Illuminatio Mie. Now, what does that mean in English, please? It means the light of the Lord is with me. And where would that have come from? Well, th those are the opening words of the 26th Psalm. And the, th they were borrowed for the uh, coat of arms of Oxford University. Uh, of which Lawrence was a scholar. I'm very intrigued indeed with all the stories they have about Lawrence's death. Can you throw some light on that please? Since the accident there have been a number of um, conspiracy theories that have been spawned really by the evidence given by Corporal uh, Catchpole at the inquest in which he said he saw a, bl a black car uh, pass by the accident site seconds before uh, the, the accident occurred and no one else uh, saw this vehicle. And what happened to Catchpole? Unfortunately, um, Corporal Catchpole committed suicide in 1940. There were other inconsistencies in the um, testimony given by the boys at the inquest and that together with the blanket of secrecy that was thrown over Bobbington uh, for the period between the accident and Lawrence's death uh, certainly gave rise to a lot of the conspiracy theories. There's no doubt that the conspiracy theories are very much part of the Lawrence legend and I'd like to go and speak to someone who made a study of uh, this aspect of the Lawrence affair. I'm here this afternoon to meet the well-known author Rodney Lake who has written quite extensively on the subject of Lawrence of Arabia and in particular the conspiracy theories. Rodney, um, I think as a result of the two books that you've written on this subject you've become quite well known as a sort of champion of the conspiracy theory. Um, how, do, how do you feel about that? Well I didn't really encourage it in the first place because um, it's now three books because we're now into Lawrence of, Dor of Dorset from uh, Arabia to Clouds Hill, which as far as I'm concerned for the time being is the definitive work on, on the subject of him in Dorset. But when researching for Dorset County Magazine as it then was in 1968, I set about interviewing people and there were lots still alive and they were bombarding me with all these peculiar stories about news blackouts, secrecy, no one being allowed to send telegrams from Crossways, Morton, um, Wool, post offices for miles around Bovington, which as with Bovy now, is a military camp and under very close um, control. And then out of the woodwork came 
Uh, Connie Bruff, the widow of George Bruff, who made the, the marvellous motorcycles. Um, Lawrence was the icon using his bikes. He gave him sort of, in effect, free bikes for the, for the publicity. And came down, saw the, the marks, black paint on it. It had actually been hit, he thought, by a vehicle. Was going to say this at the inquest. Was told not to appear, not to say anything. Pictures which we've now got and seen show that it did seem to have some kind of impact as well as um, uh, trailing along the road. Catchpole, the amazing thing about the corporal, who became sergeant, who went off to the western desert, was determined to say that he had seen the black car, discouraged other people with him, were not called, did not appear at the inquest. All that was being sort of shunted into a siding would never have appeared but for his stamina and determination which ended in this amazing story that he then shot himself in the head in a bunk um, in the western desert in what 1941 um, during the um, war against Rommel so the whole thing just became um, murkier and mysterious more mysterious added to the Lawrence enigma it's been said that uh, Lawrence had a, a murky past and that um he was even involved in uh, planning uh, secret operations. Well, Colonel Richard Meinertshagen and um, his family kept under wraps his secret diary. Mm. Um, this hero of the Great War, who was contemporary of Lawrence out there in Palestine, went on uh, to say that uh, Lawrence had been groomed as Director General of an amalgam of the entire secret um, uh, services in this country, which would include MI5, MI6, Police Special Branch, Military Intelligence. And there were lots of people out there who didn't want that to happen. And it was Churchill who saw him as being the um, wartime C in charge of MI6 and running Bletchley Park and, and the decrypts and, and, mm. and, and often wondered later um, what a marvellous um, intellectual uh, institution it could have been with all the um, Cambridge mathematicians um, having Lawrence at their head. Um, Lawrence seemed to have friends in, in low and high places. If it is true and Lawrence was assassinated, who would have benefited from his removal? It was, I must say, it was a road traffic accident. Whether or not there was something else behind that accident is, is the question mark. The trouble with identifying those people is that they are legion. Uh, there was even the emergence of Ergen um, Jewish um, Zionist zealots. So we've even got Middle Eastern terrorism um, into the plot. OK, perhaps not writ large, but, you know, 10% chance there. Um, certainly um, 40 or 50% chance people who didn't want to lose their desks, um, MI5, MI6, Special Branch, didn't want this pervert as they regarded him and, and weirdo put um, in command of them and everything. So um, they had an interest. Mm. Then there was even the Germans, and there was the fact that... Um, he was either spying for us via Henry Williamson against Hitler, or others thought he was the fascist man, he was Oswald Mosley's um, protégé, and he was doing this through um, the intellectual sort of guru of the movement, Williamson of Tarka the Otter fame, who was far more interested um, in uh, working out um, uh, the, the face of Europe for, for the next decade, and that would have been a liaison between the old um, Anglo-Saxon nations, and uh, with excluding the sort of Stalin, the Russians on one side, and uh, Roosevelt and the Americans um, on, on the other. And um, this sort of um, centre stage, um, linking British and German empires together, the, you know, they, 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 it, was, it was running as a real big thing at the time. Mm -hmm. So you've got that as, as, as yet another um, complication to, to the story, which you can read both ways, because you never knew with Lawrence who was batting for. It could have been batting for us, could have been for them. Mm. Mm. Um, the inquest so soon after Lawrence's death and the subsequent funeral it seemed to have been carried out with indecent haste and it was almost as if the authorities wanted to very quickly draw a line under the affair would you agree? Yeah I'm sure absolutely um, they wanted just to uh, get it off the front pages and uh, Lawrence um, gone they, they wanted forgotten and the, the way they did it was um, uh, to throw national sort of pride and um, adulation at him and even the 
thing about the sort of statue and, 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 the, and the stuff afterwards, almost kind of Lawrence shrines, but safely in Dorset. And uh, I think they were hoping that the whole thing um, would go away and be forgotten, have a line drawn under it and have an acceptable answer to it, which of course was um, the fact that there was a, a motorcycle accident. Lawrence, we all knew, had been riding fast and furiously around Dorset lanes. It's just that in this particular case, he seems to have had an open road and vision and uh, seems to have rather oddly gone into boys in a kind of unaccountable way. Rodney, you told me that you first became interested in T. Lawrence in about 1968. That's quite a long time ago. And um, I know that you've written quite a lot on the subject in the intervening years. Um, you must have felt that to a certain extent you've got to know the man in some way. I don't think anyone can know Lawrence. That's what's so wonderful about him. He's such a broad personality, a sort of renaissance man. He, he sort of does everything and, and, and the whole Lawrence story is so compelling. And the fact he, he's compellingly enigmatic, it's not like um, Lord Nelson, you never really knew quite what Lawrence was doing. He always had gave two stories or three stories, one to his family, one to the press, one to the public, probably one to the politicians, just innumerable stories. That, that, that is Lawrence. He, he, he faced all directions at once. I'd like to thank Rodney Legg, the prolific Dorset author, with his views on the multifaceted T. E. Lawrence. By Joe has certainly made a difference to me with the things he has to say about Lawrence. It opens up another picture of it again. Well, what have I learned from the quest? I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've been around Wareham to see the place where Lawrence would have visited, and I hope you've enjoyed it with me. In my mind, it's been very, very fascinating. It all started with a postcard like that, which got my interest, and that was to do with a motorcycle. And the motorcycle, I was told, was Lawrence's bike. It's rather odd when you think how the film which I went and saw with Peter O'Toole in. Peter O'Toole is about six foot two, and of course Lawrence was about five foot six, five foot five. The bikes which he had from Bruff used to have a smaller rear wheel put in them, so therefore, uh, because of his height, and also made, gave him a better chance with the road holding of the bike. This man has certainly achieved most mysterious things. Which, there are so many papers, there's so many books all written about him, and each one, each one is different. He's the most fantastic character. I can't really sum him up at all. I think it's tragic the way the poor man got killed in that accident. Uh, I believe he said himself that after his death, his name will go on and on and on forever, and people will never better really find out who the true man really was. Joe Fletcher is just coming to the Wareham Museum now to see our curator. He's brought some of the items he's promised, which belong to his brother. Hello, my name is Joe Fletcher. I came to see you as promised. Joe and his family have allowed this material to be exhibited in the Wareham Town Museum for all the visitors to see. It will be interesting to see what Joe has brought. These papers must go back over 70 years. Here are the documents I promised to bring down to show you. Mm. And what have we got here, Joe? Oh, this is by Mr. Harry Broughton, uh, who was the founder of, of this museum way back in the, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And he was a great um, admirer of T. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And here we have... It's dated in February 1935, when mm -hmm. the last photographs of T. E. Lawrence, who died in May of that year. Oh, yeah. And this one says, states, the Lawrence of Arabian mystery will live on forever. His bike's here, uh, there's a photograph of Lawrence of Arabia, and there's a bust of Lawrence of Arabia at the museum, and his effigy was in St. Martin's Church in Wareham. Yeah. What do you think about these conspiracy theories? Well, I think they're a lot of nonsense, mm -hmm. really, and spooky. And my brother has said it so many times, he said it at, at, the, at the post mortem, etc. He said mm -hmm. there was no black car and there was no um, anybody there whatsoever, just apart from the two boys. Yeah, yeah. He repeated it so many times. Yeah. And it, it's, it's the, the, the black car that's, that's really spawned all these 
these conspiracy theories, hadn't it? Yeah, the black car sergeant, that come from the sergeant in the army, who was mm. supposed to be the witness at the accident, which yeah. he wasn't, there was no sergeant in the army. Oh, witness really? anything, my brother said that. Yeah. yeah. So this um, MI5 business and all that is a load of rubbish. But I have a couple of letters here in this envelope, which you'll find very interesting. Yeah. We have a letter to start with from the commanding officer of my father's regiment, Royal Tank Corps. Right. He was in the Royal Tank Corps band. And it says, Band from Fletcher, I am authorised to say that the officer command in the Royal Tank Corps Corps has allowed you to speak to the press of your son making a statement in reference to the accident which his T.S. Lance was injured on the 13th of May 1935, providing that you yourself have no objection. It is signed by the commanding officer staff captain, 18535. Mm. This is a very, very interesting and important document, um, which really uh, contradicts a lot of the conspiracy theories, particularly the one about the uh, so-called blanket of silence that was thrown over Bovington, yeah. where your family and other people are involved in the events of that day um, weren't allowed to speak to any of the press or the media. But this exactly. completely contradicts that, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. No, I, yeah. I agree with you there, but of course the letter itself gives my father permission, to, yeah. provided he didn't talk about military or of, of his service. But, but it clearly states that, um, that, that he's free to talk about the accident. Yes, that's quite true, yeah. Now, I have here a statement which my brother made after he saw the film, oh, yeah. which yeah. was hardly not the truth. He, he didn't believe that, uh, yeah. well, he, he knows that there was no black car there. Mm. And he made this statement to corroborate that. And it says here, it was not the way the accent was shown in the film called Lance Arabia. Mm. It was on the wrong road to start with. And, and the, the motorcycle, motorcycle did, did not, not go, go over edge. edge, for there was no edge at all. It was old Oakland Moreland where men took their tanks for training. There are only a quarter of a mile from his home when death came to him. I only wish we had not gone on that errand at all. And then he would not have had to swerve to avoid killing us two boys. This is the real story of Lawrence's death. My name is Frank Fletcher and I was one of the boys in the accident in which he was killed. Over Frank, I think there's something coming. I did not know what to do first. It all happened so quickly. I went over to Bert, but he was out. And when I got over the shock, I went over to Lawrence. His face was covered with blood. It seemed to be coming out of his nose at first, but most of it was coming from the top of his head. I thought we were dead. I shall never forget it as long as I live.
The world naturally looks with some awe upon a man who appears unconcernedly indifferent to home, money, comfort, rank, or even power and fame. The world feels, not without certain apprehension, that here is someone outside its jurisdiction, someone before whom its allurements may be spread in vain. 